And the rest of you can turn your Bibles to Amos chapter 7. <laughs> Amos is in the Old Testament. <laughs> and we're on page 1474. <laughs> oh, different? <laughs> Okay, so we're back in Amos, and I am happy to be back. This is such an interesting book. So there's a definite shift here. We're in chapter 7, and there's a change in the book. It actually changes uh, in several ways. Change of emphasis, for one thing. Th there's something of a change in style also, and the vocabulary, too, and just in terms of what's emphasized. In fact, chapter 7 has more prose. You know what the difference between prose and poetry is? Poetry is a structured thing and prose is just like writing like a narrative part so it's got more of that in this section um, than in any other section of the book of Amos and in chapter 7 we actually in that prose section learn about Amos's history his own personal background he actually tells about his life a little bit and uh, one new emphasis we have is um, directly mentioning the king of Israel he's not been mentioned directly yet there's been all kinds of promises of judgment coming for the nation but um, King Jeroboam II is about to be addressed personally, so that's interesting. And after chapter 6, so starting this new section that ends the book, the whole book is built on a series of five visions starting in chapter 7 verse 1. So um, these are prophetic visions that Amos has. And you'll notice in 7-1 it begins, it says, Thus the Lord showed me. That's what my translation says. Yours will have something similar. Thus the Lord showed me. So three times in chapter 7 in verse 1 and then in verse 4 and then in verse 7 you see that formula. Um, and in chapter 8 verse 1 that's the, that's the same thing. Thus the Lord showed me. And then chapter 9 verse 1 it's a little bit different. He says I saw the Lord standing by an altar. So that's another way of introducing a vision. So there's three visions in chapter 7 which we'll look at today and then one in chapter 8 and one in chapter 9. Okay? Five visions over three chapters. Also note the phrase in verse 1, the Lord God. Okay? Now I've talked many times when you see the word Lord in most translations all capital letters that's God's covenant name, the name Yahweh which Jews did not pronounce. So they used the word Lord and translate when they wrote their own Bibles they would do that. And we still do that today in most translations. But, but if you look at that phrase there, it, the, which, which word is all capital letters? The word God is. And that's all, so that's also the same, that same name. But you can't say the Lord, Lord. So whenever it's talking, using just the word Lord and it talks about Yahweh, then, then the word God is put in all capital letters. So it, it, properly in Hebrew it would be the Lord Yahweh. But here it's the Lord God, all capitals. Just so you know that, that's what it's talking about there. Thank you. Um, so that's just something to notice. And what that does, why it's, when, it's, when it says the Lord God, then the Lordship aspect is talking about God's sovereignty over all things. So that's the emphasis there. That's why I wanted to bring that up. So when it says the Lord God, it's really emphasizing God's sovereignty, His sovereign power over the nations, his sovereign direction of history, all of those kinds of things. So you're going to see that expression, the Lord God, that way much more in the second half of Amos starting in chapter 7 than you do in the earlier chapters because he's talking about judgment so clearly in God's sovereign rule over nations. So it's a matter of emphasis there. I just wanted to share that with you as well. Um, so let's take the first vision beginning in chapter 1 and as we move through it we'll find something else that's different in this book and that is Amos actually having a dialogue with the Lord, which we haven't seen anything like that yet. So, verse 1, the Lord God showed me, and behold, he was forming a locust swarm when the spring crop was about to sprout. And behold, the spring crop was after the king's mowing, or harvesting, or reaping there. So now, these are visions, right? So typically, um, what is seen by a prophet is representational of some kind of coming event. It could be actually the very event that's going to happen, but often it's sort of metaphorical language or some kind of picture language to describe something that's coming when they have a vision. Sometimes they're very wild visions, like Zechariah has a really wild, well someday we'll do Zechariah, but I can't even figure out those visions half the time. But um, sometimes the imagery is fairly literal and sometimes it's more metaphorical. But anyway, the first vision he has is locusts. 
hitting at a crucial time in the calendar year of Israel. So there's two main harvest seasons in Israel. There's an earlier one and a later one. And the earlier one, the king takes his portion. So the second one's more important for survival and those kind of things. And so this plague of locusts is hitting the second crop um, and it would be just devastating. And the way it's described here is really intense. It's like they eat up everything. So locusts come it, they still come to Israel in those places today, but um, there's more technology to fight them now or beat them off. But, and sometimes the swarms are much larger than at other times, and those are years that are particularly devastating. And he's looking at a, a, a swarm of locusts that literally eats everything down to the ground, everything. So um, he's going to plead for the nation that he's prophesying against. And that's another aspect of this that is unique. So in his vision, the locusts are going crazy. So verse 2, it came about when it had finished eating the vegetation of the land that I said, so it's finished. Locusts, they're all done. They've eaten everything that's there. That's the picture in your mind here. And so I said, Lord God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand for he is small? So Amos is pleading with God to spare the nation that he's been prophesying judgment against all this time. But the vision is so horrific to him and seeing how much devastation there was, everyone's going to starve, you know. So, um, so he's pleading with God, like Moses pled. Moses, remember, pled for the protection of the people that wanted to kill him. And Amos also is pleading for God's protection on people that are going to be judged by God. He knows that. He's sent there to tell them that. But he cares about them. So, you know, when we share the gospel and tell people there's judgment, it's the same way. We care about them. That's why we're telling them. It's not that. But anyway, he's actually pleading for God, with God to not do it. And what happens? He says, this famine is too much. Verse 3, the Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, said the Lord. Wow. Just like Moses turned God's anger away from the people, Amos is turning God's anger away. At least that's how it seems. So there's a second vision. Now this vision is even worse. It is a huge raging fire. It's more than just a brush fire. It is a fire that is so unquenchable that if you took the oceans and poured them on it, it wouldn't put it out. So this isn't a fire that's even burning fuel, it's the Lord's fire. It's actually like on Mount Sinai, it's his, it's a divine fire if you will. It's complete destruction of everything. So uh, verse 4, the Lord God showed me and behold the Lord God was calling to contend with them by fire and it consumed the great deep and began to consume the farmland. So it's consuming like the Mediterranean Ocean. I mean, it's, it's like there's no way to put it out. It's like this incredible vision that he's having. It's, it's just not a little fire. It's way beyond that. It's a massive destructive fire that is unimaginably grand. Nothing can put it out. So he cries out again, verse 5, I said, Lord God, please stop. How can Jacob stand? For he is small. And the Lord hears Amos in verse 6. The Lord changed his mind about this. This too shall not be, said the Lord God. So just as with Moses, now look, God is not surprised that he's going to make this prayer. And God isn't saying, Amos, you're so right. I'm just, going to, I'm just not going to do that. For it's just like with Moses. God knows, God wants Moses to pray for the people so he can answer them. So this, these kind of conversations are divinely arranged by God so that people will pray and he will answer their prayers, it's, which is exactly what happens when you pray. Do you ever tell God something he's not aware of? <laughs> no, you never do. Why are you praying? Because you're just asking him to move his hand and from, from our point of view, he's changing his mind or whatever or moving in a different way and is healing somebody or blessing somebody or whatever your prayer need might be. But he knows all about it. He's got everything in control. The whole history of the world's already laid out already anyway. But um, he wants us to communicate with him. So, and his, his will is secret to us. So he wants us to pray. And often he'll answer those prayers. So it's, it's like that. So um, he wants Amos to pray just like he wants us to pray. So the prayer of Amos and God's relenting and actually saying, I won't do that, it's actually building up to a point for this, this third idea that's going to come out here, this third aspect of the vision here. <laughs> Judgment is coming. And what we're going to learn here is that that will not be the end of Israel. A, a, a plague of locusts like he talked about, described, could pretty much wipe out the nation. The fire thing absolutely would wipe out the nation. It's just, it's just an unquenchable, vast fire. So, um, but there is a future for Israel. 
And the very last part of chapter 9 is going to tell us about that. The very last part of the book is going to tell us about that. But um, so God wants Amos to pray to emphasize the fact that a terrible judgment is coming, but there will be survivors and the nation will continue someday in the future. That's, that's sort of the idea there. So, um, so now that we know what God won't do, what God said, I, I won't do that. Now we're going to find out in the third vision what he is doing. So verse 7, thus he showed me, and this isn't horrible or violent or anything at face value. He just said, the Lord showed me, show, showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. So you all know what a plumb line is. It's a, it's a weight on a string, basically. And, and it's really important that walls be straight because if they're not straight, eventually they're going to fall over and collapse. So builders, ancient and modern, use a plumb line or something like that too. It's probably electronic now, but they, I've seen guys still using them. So you use a plumb line to make sure a wall is, is straight. It's going up properly. You're measuring something. Is this wall perpendicular to the ground? Is it exactly straight? That's the whole idea there. So is, what's God measuring? Is he measuring their walls? Like, oh, the building inspector is here. No, that's, that's not what it's about. The purpose of this image, and it happens a couple times in the Old Testament, God talking this way, is that God is going to measure his people to see if they are straight, if they are upright if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. He's going to measure them individually and he's going to measure them as a nation. Okay, so he measures whether or not they are aligned with him in their hearts and in their actions. So verse 8, the Lord said to me, what do you see Amos? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will spare them no longer. Notice he calls them my people. So he's measuring them according to this foundational relationship they've had ever since God brought them out of Egypt, that they would be his people, that they would obey his commandments, that they would be a light to the world, a priestly nation representing God to the whole world, and they would be blessed and he would, and they would keep his law. So that's all based on the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the covenant made at Mount Sinai, where they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. So they are his people by covenant and by promise. And even though he is not loved by them at this particular time, they don't care anything about him. There's a tiny sliver of people in Israel that care about the Lord. He's not in their hearts. He's not in their hearts. So he's going to bring about the consequences that he promised when they made the covenant, um, the kind of judgment that he said would happen if they disobeyed, but he's not going to destroy everyone. So he's using the plumb line, he's going to measure who lines up and those people will be spared. So the Lord looks at the hearts of men. God looks at the hearts of men and measures us. He measures us. There's basically three divine attributes that kind of come into play here and uh, I want to talk about those. One thing, like we said, God is omniscient. He knows everything, right? So Jeremiah 17.10, I the Lord search the heart, I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. 1 Samuel 16, 7, famous passage where the Lord tells Samuel, he said, God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's exactly right. So Proverbs 21, 2, every man's way is right in his own eyes but the Lord weighs the heart, right? So God, God knows everything. There isn't anything about us that he doesn't know. Whatever's going on in the deep recesses of our minds and our hearts, he knows all of those things. Second thing about God is that God is moral. God is a moral being. He's the source of morality. Uh, he, he is why we can't help but think morally about things. I, I, I don't, I've never met a person, even the most devout atheist, that says, that describes human behavior as useful or unuseful. They might think that that's what they're measuring it by, but they say that's wrong. This is evil, this is good. They, they, they use that language because we're made in God's image, so we're moral beings, inherently moral. Even if we don't believe in God, we're moral. We, have to, we can't stop thinking that way. You wrong me and you've done wrong. You steal my stuff, you've done wrong. You don't say, it's not useful for you to steal my stuff. No, it's very useful for me. <laughs> 
I love it. What, where else do you have your others? Where do you have more stuff over there? Um, you say that's wrong. You get mad, right? Because it's, a, it's a not just. It's wrong. That's how, we, that's how we, we think. We're built that way. So every human being thinks of good and evil because we're made in the image of God. Well, God is moral. The difference between him and us is he's morally perfect. Perfect. He defines moral perfection by his very nature. So he's holy, righteous, and good, as Paul says in the New Testament. Not nice, good. There's a difference. Big difference, actually. In fact, we've already seen in Amos how much God hates evil. Remember Amos chapter 1 and chapter 2 when he kind of goes around all the nations around Israel and <laughs> says what he thinks about them and, and none of them come out well in that particular thing. And uh, he punishes every nation around Israel for their transgressions. And he says, for three transgressions and for four, or something like that. And then he lists their problems, and he's going to judge them. Well, there isn't one nation, not one nation, that he goes to. And he says, I am so impressed with the way you honor all that is good, and love your neighbor, and are free from corruption. Therefore, I will exalt you. He's looking, he's measuring, he's reading the hearts, he's, he's seeing what they're doing. And he never says that about any of them. Can you think of a nation where that's just true all the time? A people? I can't, and neither can God. Think about chapter 5, where he tells Israel what he thinks about their worship. In chapter 5, 21, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings, he says. Take away from me the noise of your songs. Get rid of your pianos. And <laughs> I will not even listen to the sound of your harps because their hearts did not worship. You guys were worshiping with your hearts, most of you here th this morning. But they weren't at all doing that. They were just bribing a God that might bring them blessings. That's all they were interested in. And he says, and right after that he says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Justice among men and righteousness toward God doing all that he commands and all that he wants of us. God is good. He's pure goodness. Therefore, he hates evil. He hates injustice. He hates idolatry. He hates sin. He hates unrighteousness. He hates the gross hypocrisy of using his name in worship and having no interest in righteousness and justice, which is what they were doing. So God is omniscient. God is holy, righteous, and good. And third, God judges creatures that are made in his image according to his morality, his righteousness. God is a judge. Acts chapter 17, 31. Um, he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Paul tells the Athenians. The very last words of the book of Ecclesiastes, we just kind of talked about that recently at the Through the Bible in the Year group on Tuesday, but the very last words are, God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether good or evil. So the plumb line is set to measure how straight God's people are. And this means the heart, of course, as well as the actions. Really the heart above everything. That's what the most important thing is. And he finds nothing good in Israel as he's measuring. The wall is not straight. The building is not going to stand. So verse 8, Behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. That last part there, I will spare them no longer. Judgment is coming and it will not be stopped. No amount of intercession is going to prevent it. And Amos knows it's true, so he doesn't even try. He doesn't say, no, don't do anything. Because he knows they deserve judgment. He's not stopping them. He just didn't want to see them wiped out. And God says, I'm not going to wipe them out, but they are going to face a very severe judgment. So Amos doesn't complain. He doesn't talk. He doesn't pray. So Israel, Israel belongs to God. They're his people by law and by the fact that he redeemed them out of Egypt. He bought them out of slavery to be his people and to show him forth to the world to be a holy people and a righteous people and a blessed people. All of that he did. So we have a calling like that too, right? As people redeemed by grace, we're to make Christ known by our lives and by the gospel message. And the people of Israel are covenant people. The plumb line is measuring them. You might remember God's word to them in Amos chapter 3 as well, chapter 3 verse 2. You only, he says to them, have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. That's a really interesting sentence. Of all the families of the earth, I have chosen you. Therefore, I will punish you. Because you know better. 
You know the truth. You know who I am. You know what my requirements are. You know what my law is. You know how I delivered you from Egypt out of slavery. So I will punish you for your iniquities. They were chosen for a great purpose and they didn't care. They really didn't care. That seems to be human nature. Sinful human nature. So when entrusted with precious things that make for peace and make for a good life, human beings discard those very things that make for that. And Israel had failed to, completely failed to live up to their covenantal responsibilities before the Lord. And if they had done what he'd wanted, they would have been blessed. He promised them incredible blessings. Incredible blessings. But they didn't believe. They didn't trust. They didn't follow. They didn't care. They believed what all the surrounding pagans believed. And so they followed their pagan traditions and ways of the peoples around them. Bribe the gods. Do whatever you want. Be as immoral as you want. And so he's going to judge them. And he focuses really on two aspects of their failure here. Their worship was one we talked about. And their king. And these are the things that are going to perish when God brings this current judgment. Even though God will preserve a remnant of the people for a future blessing to Israel, their worship will end and their king will end. And this is where Jeroboam comes in. So look at verse 9 of chapter 7. The high places of Isaac will be desolated and the sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. And I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So where are Jews supposed to worship? In Jerusalem. In the holy city, at the temple. That's where they're required to go there. But you know, we've talked about it before. Um, they worship pagan idols. That's what the high places, high places, pagans build their things up high because it's, I don't know, it's closer to the heavens or whatever, but um, they would go up there and worship and perverse and twisted in uh, degenerate ways. We talked about temple prostitution being normal in Israel. That went on up there at those high places. And then it talks about the, the sanctuaries there. Those are the golden calves that were built. One just before you cross the border to go into where uh, Judah, where Jerusalem is. He wanted them to worship a golden calf there. They were worshiping Yahweh, the true God, but it threw a golden calf. And then he put one way north of Is in Israel so that people would be drawn away that way. And then he, but the one down south would intercept people going to Jerusalem and say, you're going to worship here. So that's what they did. And it was the king that decided to put those golden calves there. You remember what his name was? The king that made those golden calves? It was Jeroboam. That was Jeroboam the first. Amos is dealing with Jeroboam the second who's actually 200 years farther down the line. So they've been doing this all this time and they never corrected themselves. So these Jeroboam the first and Jeroboam the second. I want to talk about Jeroboam the first for a bit. There's a, par there's a part of history here that most Christians aren't real familiar with about the dividing of the nation. So we know that after Solomon the nation divided into Judah in the south and Israel in the north. But it's really amazing what God told Jeroboam the first about this. Jeroboam was just a, he, he worked for Solomon. He was part of Solomon's, uh, you know, officers and re revenue guys, one of these uh, key people there. And God ordained that Israel be divided because of Solomon's personal failure. He, was an, he, be, he became an idolater towards the end of his life, which is horrible horribly tragic. It set a horrible example. Mainly through his wives. He married women from other lands. They brought their gods with them. And he said, okay, you can have your gods here. And then occasionally he would go with his wives and actually worship these other gods. It was unbelievable. So God said he was going to, after, he said, for David's sake, I'm going to let Solomon complete his reign. But after that, I'm going to split the kingdom. God decided to do that. So Jeroboam had served Solomon and God sent a prophet who quite dramatically tells Jeroboam that for David's sake the kingdom of Solomon would remain unified until he was dead but when Solomon died Jeroboam would be given authority over ten tribes the northern tribes so here's just a guy just one of the officers and God sends a prophet to tell him I'm going to give all of those tribes under your care now that's quite a privilege thank you Lord I will serve you faithfully, he did not say. 
And he tells him, he says, I'm going to leave the tribe of Judah with Solomon's son. He'll be over that tribe. In fact, he says quite literally, he says, I will give one tribe that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. So the prophet tells Jeroboam, Jerusalem is still the worship center. That's where God's name is. And David's son will rule over that. Solomon's son will rule over that. But the rest of it I'm going to give to you, Jeroboam. And you will rule it for me. But don't forget, that's the center of worship is still Jerusalem. Nothing changes with regard to that. He tells him that. Mount Zion, Jerusalem. All of this is in 1 Kings chapter 11, one of the most important chapters in understanding the flow of Israel's history in the Bible. And God does not assume that Jeroboam is going to be this corrupt, horrible, idolatrous, wicked man. He doesn't assume that. He's making him special promises. In fact, in 1 Kings 11.37 he says this to Jeroboam, he says, I will take you and you shall reign over whatever you desire and you shall be king over Israel. Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and will build you an enduring house as I built for David. And I will give Israel to you. What a promise. What a promise. So he had the opportunity to build a lasting dynasty in obedience to God. He had a word from the Lord, a wondrous, wondrous promise. The God who made the universe promised Jeroboam that he would build him an enduring house. All he had to do was follow the law of Moses. That's all he had to do was be faithful. Immediately when Solomon died and he became the ruler of Israel, he built the golden calves. Immediately. That's what he did. First thing he did. He didn't honor the Lord. He didn't trust the Lord. He didn't believe the Lord. He didn't love the Lord. So here we are in Amos's time, 200 years later basically, with another Jeroboam who trusts also only in his own ideas, his own intellect, his own wisdom for holding a kingdom together through force or whatever and it's going to fail. That's, that's what Amos chapter 7 is about. So this next part is a shift in literary style. This is where we go into the prose section, the narrative section, but we see the same thing. So we're moving from prophetic poetry to narrative. Um, the story in prose is about Amos's relationship with a priest named Amaziah who was the priest at Bethel where he built the golden calf that was right on the border of Israel just before the people went there. So it's a, it's a, it's a conversation between Amos and this priest of the golden calf, Amaziah. That's where we are now. So Bethel was that religious shrine there. So in verse 10 we meet the current priest of Bethel. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent word to Jeroboam the king of Israel saying, okay, the priest is writing to King Jeroboam saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure all his words. For thus Amos says, Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. That's a pretty serious accusation to make against anybody uh, in the time of a despotic king with the power of life and death in his hands. So he's telling him directly that Amos is proclaiming his death, the king's death, and the fall of the kingdom to the Assyrians which was this rising empire. Kings don't like to hear that stuff. But you know it's interesting Amaziah doesn't do any harm to Amos. A lot of prophets in the Old Testament were physically attacked or even killed for making prophecies like that but he, they don't kill Amos. I think because things are going so well for the kingdom. They're riding high. That's, that's, the, con that's the historical context. They're rich. They're powerful. Israel seems like a it's, it's probably stronger than it's ever been and they're confident. They're confident. So he doesn't hurt him but he does tell him to hit the road. So verse 12, Amaziah said to Amos, go you seer, seer is another name for a prophet, flee away to the land of Judah and there eat bread and there do your prophesying. Go home and prophesy. But no longer prophesy at Bethel. That meant that he was prophesying at Bethel. So he wasn't just walking around town 
he would go to he went to the golden calf place and when people were coming there to worship he'd make all these prophecies don't do that for it is a sanctuary of the king and a royal residence he says and again Amos as far as we know never suffers physically from um, the leadership as other prophets did it might be because again they're so at ease but at this moment um, Jeroboam seems to be very secure. So Amaziah is just telling him to scram. Ski daddle. Vamoose. Go away. Make yourself scarce. Those are all Hebrew expressions. But <laughs> no. Not really. Okay. Anyway, unsurprisingly, um, I think that's how elites in American culture regard people that are faithful to the Lord as well. Um, just be quiet. Just go away. Go, go sit in your churches. Don't, don't talk. So he says, go home to Judah prophesy there and he treats Amos like he's just a weird guy doing his own weird thing. He's like a lunatic or a madman, some kind of religious kooky guy. So Amaziah is a, is a priest who doesn't fear God. He doesn't think that prophets are anything to worry about. It doesn't bother him that these prophets are, are saying these things. It doesn't bother him that these truths are coming to him. So Am- Amaziah's job is to run a shrine to Yahweh to keep people from worshiping where they're supposed to. That's his job. That's, that's it. That, it doesn't have a theology. He doesn't believe anything in particular. That's his mission in life. And that's where Amos has been telling his story. So who is Amos? Why is he there? Listen, he answers him. Verse 14, Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock and the Lord said to me go prophesy to my people Israel. So he's not bonkers. He's not a religious enthusiast. This isn't his idea. He was really happy tending his flocks and taking care of his sycamore trees. He's not from the school of the prophet. When he says I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, he's not part of the prophetic community which we've talked about before. There's, there was a school of the prophets. There are the sons of the prophets talked about in the Old Testament. Look, bands of people, groups of people that were together. Then some of them were real prophets and the others supported them. He said, I have nothing to do with those people. I'm just a herdsman and I take care of my figs. That's what I do. God told me to come here and speak to Israel. So that's why I, I left Judah. That's why I'm here. God gave me the message I'm speaking, he's saying. And Amos says, the Lord has a message for you, Amaziah. The Lord is going to answer you, Amaziah. Verse 16. Now, hear the word of the Lord. You are saying you shall not prophesy against Israel, nor shall you speak against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife will become a harlot in this city, and your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled up by a measuring line and you yourself will die upon unclean soil. Moreover, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. He's describing the Assyrian invasion which is only about 30 years away. And they're going to to take all the elite people away that live and take them into their land and make them their slaves. They're going to destroy the cities and tear down the walls. They're going to slay. Now the Assyrians, the Assyrians, brutal, brutal people. They make the Russian army look like Boy Scouts in terms of all the kind of monstrous stuff they're doing. They, they, they were a terrorist, deliberately a terrorist nation. They, they wanted to just make people so afraid of them so they built mounds and mounds of human heads. They did all kinds of incredibly horrible things. They flayed people alive, cut all their skin off. It was part of their method. He's saying, that's going to happen to your children. Your wife's going to end up without support. She'll have to turn to prostitution. You will be carried away and die in an unclean land. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the Lord. It really is. It really is. So Amaziah was the worst of the worst as a human being, leading people away from God. That was his mission in life. That was his job. There's a lot of different ways that men do evil, but leading people away from God to intentionally do that, there's nothing worse than that. So 
so we humans do a lot of evil. It's really interesting when you watch the war going on right now because um, you hear you hear people in Ukrainian cities and people being interviewed saying, "This is the 21st century. We don't do this anymore." Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Human nature hasn't changed. Human nature is violent and cruel and unjust. You know, one blessing of li living in a democratic republic like we do and having a constitution that actually spells out our rights, the whole purpose of that system, if you read the Founding Fathers, read the Federalist, Federalist Papers, it's to keep evil balanced, not to keep it away because that's impossible and they knew that. They knew human beings were corrupt. It's to balance things so that nobody gets the top. So you have a, a government that's divided in different branches and you have um, no one group can ascend to the top because then they might get voted out against. So as long as people follow the system and then you have certain enumerated rights so you can go to the courts if the, if the kings or the rulers break, violate your rights and the courts can overthrow what the king is doing and all that kind of stuff. That's how they thought about it. By, I mean the president of course. But um, that's what they mean. That's, that, that's the system. But all it's doing is keeping evil in check. But it doesn't mean we're all good. Or every, or, is there a total lack of corruption? In, in, in our government? I mean, is it all about how wonderful they want things to be for us? Is that really what it's all about? So we always have to be diligent because evil is, is always finding its way, right? There's always evil going on. So we have to be vigilant to keep our rights. Humans are not good and God's judgment is very real and his hatred of evil is very real and you and I are dealing with a being that is pure holiness. He's our creator but he's pure holiness. He's not mean, he's good. Pure goodness. And we live in such a sinful world that real goodness looks weird to people. They don't get it just like what you were sharing about Jennifer's situation. What? Faithfulness? Your husband? Wants, you, want, you trust him? God doesn't change like we do. So human beings are constantly reinventing morality to suit their own desires and lusts, right? That's changing all the time. Morals change and cultures change. People delight to invent new ways to do evil. But judgment is real and God's judgment is eternal. And let me tell you why I think God acts in history. You know, people say the Old Testament is so different than the New. The Old Testament seems so temporal and the New Testament talks much more in eternal terms, generally speaking. And that's because spiritual realities are not visible to us, are they? I mean, I can talk about hell and heaven, but we've never been there. Heaven is beyond our sight. Hell is beyond our sight. We can't see them until we're dead. So the, in the Bible, God is working in our world, in history, in the Old Testament, with real countries and real people. Blessings and punishments are events that we can see because if God promises judgment, we actually see it in the world that he fulfills those threatenings of judgment. And he did all this built around one nation, these chosen people of Israel to bless or curse based on their behavior so we can see that he does do these things. He is like this. He is holy. He is just. He is good. So we have this amazing account of God directly dealing with the children of Abraham so we can see what he's like. We see God's favor in the world. We see their sin in the world. And we see in this world how God reacts to sin. God's message to Amaziah could be you will go to hell for your idolatry, but that, that's out of sight, isn't it? Yeah. Amaziah keeps living his perfect life and doing, doing his thing and then he dies and he's gone and maybe he's there, maybe he isn't, I don't know. But the destruction of his nation, the wreck, wrecking of his family, him going into exile and dying in an unclean place, as he puts it, we see that. That actually happened. So the destruction of this nation and his family is real. And so when God makes eternal threatenings and talks about his judgment in terms of our souls, that's real too. He, he's showing us what he's like. He does judge people. He does judge nations in the world. And sometimes when God's judging countries like this, he doesn't even directly have to do anything. Like he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like personally, like 
rain fire and brimstone on them. All he's doing here is bringing one wicked people who want to conquer other people and just say, I'm going to let you have these people now. You, you're, you do use your wickedness over here. He uses them like a tool. The Bible is really clear that God uses human evil to serve his judgment on human evil sometimes in this world. So we know that human nature um, is designed, well, has come about to choose lusts over God. We know that. They're, our passions are more important than God. And we corrupt everything God, that God gave us, that God intended for us. And our inhumanity takes a lot of different forms. People cheat each other, they oppress each other, they conquer each other, they use each other. Now, there are places in the world where you can, if you have enough resources in life, you know, and you live in a free society, that you can be relatively free of terror and blatant injustice. But there aren't very many places like that in the world, actually. And there are fewer all the time. It's not going in that direction, it's going away from that direction, our world. But this world is just temporary. So the worst thing that can happen is not that we lose our rights. The worst thing that can happen is that somebody leads us away from God. That's the worst thing. Civilizations rise and fall, but individual souls, every individual soul, your soul, my soul, we live forever. We live forever. So Amaziah, to destroy people's souls is the greatest of evils. It's the worst evil. And what Amaziah did was worse than just disobeying the laws of the, of, that were made at Mount Sinai. So here he is standing beside his golden calf, leading people away from God, and now he's telling a messenger of God to shut up and go home. That's quite similar to what we see today with some of these people that are deconstructing their faith. They're literally trying to lead people away from Jesus Christ, to lead them away from God, and encourage other people to do that as well. And people that don't have God's grace in their hearts, that have their hearts open to Him, to them God is too severe in His goodness. He's too good. He's too severe in His goodness. And as we have seen, God does condemn sin thoroughly. But the great news, and that's the best news of all time, is that out of this incredible love, God condemned sin in His Son, Jesus Christ, so that we could be forgiven and live with Him as His children forever. If we humble ourselves before Him, we become His children for eternity. That's the reality. Salvation isn't easy. It's very costly. It costs blood, but not our blood. It's the blood of Christ that saves. His blood cleanses us because it satisfies the justice of God. Jesus is literally the judge serving the sentence that we deserve and that sentence is death. Most people disdain the blood of Jesus. I don't need that. Yes they do. Yes they do. Everybody does. So God's judgment is real and so is his incredible mercy to the undeserving. And we can see it right here in a this world sense in the Old Testament. It's good stuff, but it prepares our hearts to understand what Christ has done for us by bearing our sin. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider your judgments, we acknowledge that they are right and good. Nothing bad comes that humanity has not called down on itself. But even in judgment, Lord, we see your mercy because you tell us and you show us what sin deserves and that awakens us. And your mercy in Christ is so gracious. We want to cling to it. Cling to him with full hearts. Full of gratitude for such a worthy savior. So we thank you for that. And as we celebrate at your table this morning, may we be ever mindful of your mercy and grace to us in Christ. Amen.